All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I am Mike Dawson, and we're going to go ahead and get ready to get started here. Um, just a, a few quick logistics. Um, it looks like a lot of people already are, um, but if you're not familiar with uh, Zoom, um, if you look down on the, the bottom, you should have a little panel and you have question, uh, Q and A areas which you guys can ask questions and we'll do our best um, today to answer some of those during the program. Um, you can also let us know on the chat feature um, where you guys are from. It looks like a lot of people already did and about how many people are in your group and let us know. Um, also at the end today, we'll have a little poll near the end and you can let us know what you thought of the program. So we'll, we'll shoot that out at the end, but just wanted to throw that out there for everybody. So hopefully everybody can hear really well. Let us know in the chat if you can hear and everything and you can see. Um, so today we're going to be talking about frogs and toads around the St. Louis uh, region, at least around here. Um, so we're going to kind of go through a little bit about the basics about frogs and toads. And so first thing I wanted to do is uh, introduce myself. So I'm Mike Dawson. I do work at the St. Louis Zoo and I work at the education department. And I've had one of the, I think, one of the most fascinating jobs I've ever had in my life working there. Um, and one of the many different jobs I have are or uh, different duties I have is I, I do a lot of the citizen science projects. And one of my run is a frog watch. And so we train individuals to go out and monitor sites for frogs and toads. Um, and, and so one of the things I got really good at is learning frogs and toads um, for training people about their frog calls. So we're gonna spend some time learning a little bit about frogs and toads and learning some of their calls. So what I wanted to start with is we're gonna do a poll in a minute and I'm gonna play a call. And so go ahead and listen to this and you'll see the poll. Give you guys time to uh, go ahead and answer that particular poll and it, it, it is is neat so we have a few people that out there that are saying that there are some frog experts here and uh, some people have never heard there at least not at all never heard any of these recognize any of these frog calls um, and so these are actually recorded in the st louis area um, so these were recorded um, up in um, your spanish lake um, just to give you guys up in north county so there are a lot of different frog species around here, and we're going to go ahead and end this poll in about uh, five seconds here. So go ahead and, and make your choices. All righty. So it looks like a bunch of us out there recognize some of these or at least consider themselves in the middle of recognized frog calls. And just so you know, it's uh, when I took a frog test about 10 years ago, I thought it was pretty good. And I actually scored a 60% on an auditory test for frogs and toads, which I believe in school is, is about a D. Um, I've gotten a lot better. Um, and the way you get better is practice. So today we're going to listen to a lot of different frog calls today. And we'll give you guys some resources of where you can listen to frog calls and practice learning all your different frog calls. So let's jump right in a little bit about frogs and toads. So the first question is, is what's going on with our frogs and toads? Are they doing okay? And it's a great question a lot of people ask me. Um, and and the, the question is around the world, frogs and toads, um, and, and this is for amphibians in general, um, are not doing well in many different areas. Um, our country, uh, some of them are doing a little better than other places in the world. Um, some of our, our amphibian species are, are disappearing for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so, some of them, there's fungal diseases they're fighting, there's pollution and habitat destruction. Um, around our area, um, if you were to look at the city, and I spent a lot of time looking at a lot of the different aquatic areas and ponds and places, um, what we've noticed is we have a lot of frogs and toads, but certain ones um, are, are disappearing or are having a harder time finding some of these guys, especially in the core of the city. As you go outside the Interstate 270 belt, a lot of times you can find these at some of those parks a little farther out. But around our area, some of them, not all of them, but some of those species are just a little harder to find. And I have some pictures over here on the left. So I've been spending a lot of time this year and last year looking for some of these to try to find out where they still are. Um, in some of our parks. And so you're going to learn calls from these actual guys today. So maybe you'll be able to help me out. Maybe you'll hear some of these guys in places I haven't been yet. So a good question is why are amphibians and frogs in general being affected 
uh, with our environment, what's going on. And so one of the biggest reasons is they're just very sensitive to the environment. And the reason why is their entire life cycle from the eggs, the tadpole and everything, a lot of them are in water most of the time. And so anything that gets into that water, um, any kind of pollution from roads and streets and runoff or things that get into the water can have a big effect on our frogs and toad populations. And because of that, sometimes it, it gives us an idea of how our environment is, how the water around us and our streams and creeks, the quality of it, if it, if it has pollution, then a lot of times the frogs disappear. Um, and so the other question is, are they important to us? Is it important to still have our frogs and toads? And the answer is definitely yes. They're a huge benefit uh, in the natural world. Um, and, and they definitely eat a lot of insects. And so we want these frogs and toads outside. Um, and if you think of all the different sizes, the bullfrog, and we'll get to talking about it in a little bit, but this is where our largest one eats a lot of insects, pretty large and can eat a lot of different sizes. And we have some of our smaller ones, um, the spring peeper, we'll talk about in a minute. And those guys have, are so tiny, they eat all kinds of stuff like mosquito larvae and stuff like that. So the different sizes eat all different kinds of food. And they're also a massive amount of food for other animals. A lot of snakes and birds and things eat them. There's also a big benefit for medications. Um, there's a lot of drugs that we are studying because of the stuff on their skin. Their slime has a lot of different chemicals in it. Um, that protects these guys in the wild, but could also be very useful for medicine. Um, poison dart frogs in um, South America, a lot of their secretions that protect them from predators eating them, which is what makes them poisonous, can be used in different medicines. So they're very, very useful to have just for us, and we want them around. So let's jump right into some frog and toad basics before we get into the frog calls. So frogs are vertebrates, so they're animals with bones in their bodies, just like you and me. Um, and they break into three groups. So amphibians themselves um, break into frogs and toads, salamanders, and cecilians. Um, most people have probably heard of frogs and toads and salamanders. If you've never heard of cecilians, um, they're a neat, they're a legless amphibian. We do not have them um, in the United States, uh, but you can find them down in Mexico, Central America, and South America, and Africa. Um, and they typically live in the soil. They're considered fossorial, which means they live under the ground and come up in the leaf litter at nighttime. And they're pretty neat. And so we're not going to spend any time today talking about them, but they're definitely worth looking up. They're pretty interesting. So we're going to jump back over to frogs and toads and spend a little more time about the characteristics of a frog and a toad. So some of the basic things is, of course, they're vertebrates, so they have a skeleton. Um, this is the typical shape of a skeleton of most frogs and toads. Um, one of the things I love to point out, if you look at that skeleton and how big those eye orbits are, these guys have huge eyes, which is, means they have great eyesight and typically very good eyesight at nighttime as well. And if you look over the picture of the eye, they have a tapanum, which means if you shine a light at night, it, it reflects the light. Um, if you look at this particular ear circle, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but they, they definitely have some very neat skin over here. Their skin is slimy. It could be bumpy and warty, depends what kind of animal and where you live, um, but they do have slime and it does have a lot of different secretions in it to protect it. Some protect them from drying out. Some protect it from predation because a lot of these guys don't taste good and they have different chemicals. Um, so it's a good idea if you ever touch a frog, it's not gonna hurt your hands, but it's a very good idea to make sure you wash your hands before you eat. They also have a lot of neat adaptations for feet. Everything from this is a tree frog uh, foot right here from little suction cups that can stick to stuff um, to web feet if you happen to be a bullfrog or one that's more aquatic. So a lot of neat adaptations when it comes to living in the water and around the water. One of the other good characteristics of frogs and toads is they always lay eggs in water, at least in our country. And so one of the neat things for looking for them is you're gonna be looking for bodies of water. And some of them live in different places. So some are gonna lay their eggs um, in ponds. Um, some are gonna lay their eggs in fishless ponds or ditches or standing water. And some of these guys, which is kind of neat, I'll show you the next picture, go all of them go through metamorphosis. And so some other metamorphosis going from an egg to a tadpole or a larva to an adult is different speeds. So some of these guys can metamorphosize within a month and some may take two years. So when you think of like your large bullfrog, these, those guys are gonna lay eggs and they'll hatch and they'll be in the, the larval or tadpole stage for about two years before they finish growing legs and shrinking the tail and coming out of the water. Whereas your spring peepers are gonna lay their eggs and come out of the water typically within a month and a half. And so some of them are gonna lay their eggs in water that may dry up and so they can live that way. Whereas if you're gonna live for two years, you're gonna to have to choose a pond or something like that. And that's why we find frogs and toads in many different places. Another big characteristic is typically your male, at least in our country, is usually bigger than the female. And so if you see in this picture, gives you an idea size-wise, typically a lot of times your male is larger 
I'm sorry, your, your male is a little bit smaller than your female. Now the difference a lot of people ask me is what's the difference between a frog and a toad? It's not a simple answer, but I'll go over some of the basics. And so one of them has to do with their skin. Most toads spend a lot more time away from water and so the protection they've adapted by having thicker and bumpy skin. If you look over here, that's a typical look of a, of a toad skin. Um, the bumps are not warts, they're the skin bumps and um, you cannot get a wart from a toad. Um, you can get a wart from another person, but not a toad. Um, but it's still a good idea to wash your hands. If you look over here on the left in the frog skin, typically moist, smooth, and skin and thin, thin enough that a lot of these guys breathe quite a bit through their own skin or respirate through their skin, um, which is an amazing thing to think about having skin almost like a little lung so they can breathe a lot through their skin and water can pass in and out through their skin, which is why when things get into the water, unfortunately, when the water goes through their skin and they absorb different things, some of the things dissolved into the water can also go through their skin. Another big difference between a frog and a toad, if you take a look over here, these are some eggs I found out. And so this is frog eggs, a good example. Look kind of like a big mass of grapes or tiny little circles in a, in a clump. And on the right over here, this is a good example of toad eggs. Look like a string or a pearl or a necklace. Um, so those are good, good examples. If you happen to see eggs in water, sometimes you can tell the, the difference between an egg, uh, between a frog and a toad. Another big difference is typically frogs, most species of frogs in our country have upper row of teeth. Um, they're not really big teeth, but they're kind of little serrated edges along their upper and it helps them hold on food when they grab it. Um, and toads don't have any. So if you were to look in the mouth of a toad, they don't have any teeth at all. Um, and both these guys do have that long tongue and they can use it to help grab their food and swallow their food. Now another huge difference and an easy visual way to tell them between a frog and a toad besides the body shape. Um, is they have these glands in the back right here. And so these glands are where all the toxins or poisons are. And most people ask me, are frogs and toads poisonous? And I would say yes, to some degree. Some are less than others. Um, toads have toxins and for protection inside these little, air, these little bumps. And if they get upset or somebody bites them like a, like a coyote or a fox or a raccoon, there's tiny little pinholes and it kind of oozes out pretty fast and it looks kind of like white sappy stuff. And if you got it on your lips or your mouth, it can burn. And that's why a lot of these guys survive. They may be spit out and it's good protection. Um, when I was little, I had a basset hound and my dog actually ate a toad um, and he was foaming at the mouth because the stuff irritated his mouth. And so definitely um, I would hope my dog wouldn't bother him again. Now let's jump right into frog calls and because this is one of the fun things about frogs and toads and that's why we, we know a lot about them because you hear them, they're pretty noisy. And so we're gonna learn about the advertisement or breeding call. A lot of frogs and toads make a lot of different noises, but these are the ones that we hear the most because this is the way that actually a boy, a boy frog finds a girlfriend. And so it's pretty a loud yelling match for most different kinds of frogs and usually males come out early and they go down to a water source and they try to find a good spot and they make a lot of noise. And when the girls come out, they actually listen to the noises. And if you're healthy, you're a, a good quality frog, that's what they're choosing. And they come along and they choose which frog they're looking for. And so it is important for these guys to be able to, to make good noises. Now, if you ever pick them up, sometimes they make what's called a release call. Um, when you get too close to them, you might've gone up to a pond before and you hear, Ee! and they jump into the water. And so that's actually uh, an alarm call. So they do make other noises, but we're gonna learn today the advertisement or breeding call. So one of the things along with that is you'll notice, I pointed out earlier, they have this tapanum and this is the ear, the ear circle right here. And so this is actually kind of like an eardrum on the surface. Um, usually boys have a larger tapanum. And so that's one of the ways sometimes visually you see one with a really large tapanum, bigger than their eye. Um, sometimes it indicates it's most likely a boy. Now, when you talk about sound, the way they make sound is really neat. They have air sacs and vocal cords and they blow air through those. And by changing the shape of their vocal cords and changing the shape of their um, vocal sacs, and then some of them have different vocal type of vocal sacs, they can make a lot of different sounds. Um, if you look over here, this is a, like a bullfrog is an internal vocal sac. It's like they swallowed a balloon. Um, and so their entire chest area and under the throat inflates and it's uh, almost their whole body moves and vibrates when they're calling. Um, in the middle here, this is the paired uh, vocal sac. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of like having two vocal sacs on either side of your throat. Um, and then you have the single external vocal sac. So this is like a tree frog or a toad. It's underneath their chin. You can see it. Um, usually these are, these are what we see the most. The most common would be the single, um, but they're pretty neat. 
So before you go to listen, a good time thing to know is when to listen. And so typically frogs and toads um, are going to come out um, around dusk time. Now, if it's rainy out or overcast, you're definitely going to see them. You're definitely going to hear them. Um, but the most the time they're most active is usually um, as the sun goes down. And they usually call from about sundown all the way to around one of the mornings or peak time if you're going to go out and listen. So let's go ahead and let's learn some of the frogs and toads in, in our area. So jump right in here. We're going to learn some frogs and toads and pay attention to the calls you're going to learn because we're going to have some polls and see if you can remember the frog calls. So this is the Eastern American toad and they're found all over the place. They make a really neat noise and they typically come out and call about April. So they should be calling now. So let's go ahead and listen to that. A nice high pitched trill. So, hopefully, you guys can remember that because we'll come back to that one. So, that's an American toad. Hopefully, you've seen it. So, these are the small little guys in our area um, related to tree frogs, and there's four of them we're going to learn. So, one of the first ones we'll start up here. This is one that most people have heard. Um, these are tree frogs. So, you hear them around a lot of times, people houses because they climb up the trees in your houses. Another one that's pretty common right now that also comes out in April, a lot of these are the, on the left here are, are a little bit later, April into May. Um, this is the cricket frog. If you do a lot of fishing, sometimes you'll see these down by ponds and things like that. They sound like two marbles or rocks hitting together. Now, some of the earliest ones over here, um, and when I mean early, they typically come out in February. This year, they came out a little bit late in the first week of March. You have spring peepers and chorus frogs. So let's go ahead and listen to a spring peeper. Sounds like a bird to most people. Chorus frog and these guys to me sound like um, uh, uh, little pebbles falling down on a rain stick or some people say it sounds like taking your thumb over a comb. So see if you can try to remember those. So right now we're up to five different frog calls and we're going to learn two more. I'm sorry, three more. So right now, these are the last big ones we're gonna cover today. So these are your true frogs. These are the ones that live in ponds around us, pretty common around here. Um, and a lot of these start a little bit later. Um, so we're gonna go in order. So in the very middle, this guy actually does come out um, in, in the middle of March and into April. So we'll do him first. They sound like um, chuckling a little bit. Those are pretty common in the early spring. A lot of times you find them with the spring peepers. And then over here, this is your green frog. Um, these are pretty good sized frogs. Um, a lot of times you find these in ponds along with the bullfrog. Some people sound, they sound like a little banjo, like somebody plucking a string. And then this is the most uh, most known frog because of their call. They're pretty common around here, find them in lakes and ponds, um, and they have a very distinctive call. A lot of people like to say it sounds like a jagorum. Um, now, we're going to go ahead and see how good your memory is. So we're going to put a poll out there. I'm going to play a call, and then we'll throw the poll out there. So go ahead and listen to this. What you're going to be listening for is how many, um, I'm sorry, what kind of frog or toad um, do you think this is?
you'll have some choices of frogs and toads to choose from. So let's see, a lot of people are throwing guesses out there. Really good. So right now, it looks like most people are thinking that this is a, a cricket frog. So it was a high pitch call, a nice trill. So we'll go ahead and stop that poll. Um, that was actually the American toad calling. So that noise you heard there, that high pitch trill would be American toad. Very good, you guys are pr pretty close to that one. Let's go ahead and let's try another one, a single one calling here. So we'll jump over to another one here. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this one. Give you another few seconds for this poll. You guys are doing great. All righty, fantastic. You guys did really good. And that and majority of us said that that was a cricket frog. Um, and that's correct. That was definitely a cricket frog. So kind of like two marbles or rocks hitting together, um, the way that I think about it. Um, and it sounds like tick, 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 tick. Pretty, pretty uh, common frog um, around here and a fun one to look for. Now let's make it a little more complicated. So unfortunately, when you go out and listen for frogs, sometimes you'll hear a single, but sometimes you hear several frogs at one time. So go ahead and we are going to listen to, oh, wrong one, there we go. We are gonna go ahead and listen to this clip and you guys are going to see if you can figure out how many species of frogs or toads are calling. Good. We'll go ahead and we'll give you a second or so to finish that poll. And we'll go ahead and end that poll. So very good. So we have the, the choice between uh, one, two, three, and four. So the majority of us were saying there were three frogs calling. Um, and when it, it is hard sometimes when you hear a lot of frogs calling and if you had insects calling, it's a lot of noise to listen for. Um, and in this particular one, that was correct. There were actually three species, whoop, hold on, three species of frogs calling in that one. So you guys did great. So let's go ahead and listen to it again and see if you guys can figure out which three are calling. Fantastic. We'll go ahead and, and we'll, uh, we'll give you another second or so because that's a lot to listen to. So we had three species of frogs of the ones we've heard, which ones were calling. All righty, fantastic. So it looks like um, we definitely have quite a few of them out here and you guys did great picking out which ones they were. The majority of the ones that we picked out are, are correct. And so um, those frogs that were calling were the American toad, cricket frog, and spring peeper. Um, and a lot of these do call together in the springtime. So sometimes you can't figure it out, the process of elimination. Um, typically bullfrogs and uh, some of the other ones call in the summertime, so they don't always call at the same time. And so you guys did great. A lot of times it just takes practice at listening to them um, and getting good at knowing which ones are calling. So a good question to wrap up with is how can I help with frogs and toad conservation? How can we help our frogs and toads? Well, there's lots of different things you could do. Um, the one I just thought about today that we would talk about 
um, you can build some habitat like toad abodes. And this is a good example of one and we can give you some resources. Um, it's real simple. You can put a, a flower pot, a ceramic flower pot or a plastic one. Um, and the reason why this is helpful for some of them is as they're moving from water sources and places like that, you could put a little dish out with some rocks and a little bit of water, gives them a place to sit. Also attracts uh, some animals for them, but they're looking for places to hide during the daytime. And so a lot of times, um, a lot of toads, I have one that hides under my concrete um, patio and on a little crack. So a lot of times adding something to your garden gives them a place to hop inside during the daytime. So, so that's something you could build to attract these guys. And you'll notice in this picture, there's a lot of plants around and that's something you'd want um, if you're going to put it in a garden is make sure that it has a lot of vegetation around it. So those are some of the things you can do. And of course, make sure we don't um, pollute our waterways and things like that. Um, make sure if you see trash, if you can always participate in a trash pickup or something like that um, to make sure our waterways are clean. So those are some great ideas and, and there's more online um, that you can look up. Um, we're going to jump to the end here. I have a few questions. Um, I wanted to give you guys a good resource. Um, so one of the places you can go, we made this website for our Frog Watch volunteers, but it's open to the public. It's www frogwatchstl.com and there's a lot of um, places on here where, where you can listen to frog calls. So all the ones we heard today and many more, you can go in and listen to all the frogs and toads from around this area. So check it out as a good resource. And there's also resources on this website for additional places to listen to frog calls. So I had a few questions before the program I wanted to run through and then we'll try to answer a few before the end of today. Um, so one of the questions was, what is the biggest frog and toad in the United States? Um, the biggest one um, in the United States is actually the bullfrog. Um, they actually get the largest um, in the United States. Um, somebody asked what predators eat frogs and toads? All kinds of predators eat. I mentioned a few, but snakes, birds, raccoons, there's a lot of different things that eat frogs and toads. Um, and do frogs and toads come out during the day or night? They can come out during both, but they're more active at nighttime. If they come out during the daytime, typically um, they're going to come out when it's overcast or rainy, um, and that keeps them from drying out. Um, how long do frogs and toads live? Um, it depends on the type of frog and toad, but it's a very good question. Um, a good example would be a lot of our native lake toads in, in the wild, typically seven to 10 years is a good average. In captivity, some of them can live a lot longer. Um, but that's a good average for most of our frog and toads in North America. And the last question was how, frog can a, or how high can a frog jump? A, a good question to ask. Typically, people don't measure how high they jump. They usually measure how far they can jump. Um, and the record for some of those would be either a bullfrog in our country um, or some of the leopard frogs. And some of the distance um, that's been uh, calculated for a few of them, it's over six feet in length. And if you go in the different places in the world, there are some that jump even farther, but in our country, typically one, either the leopard frog or bullfrog and, and the average is a little over six feet, which is really far for, for a type of frog. So we're gonna kind of get to the wrap up here. Um, if you have some questions, I'll try to answer a few before the end here. I'll look at the questions and answers. I know we've been answering a few along the way. Um, so go ahead and add a few here um, and I'll go see if we can answer a couple of them. So one of the questions was, is there a certain area um, to, to find uh, frogs and toads? And yes, there are. Um, different kinds of frogs and toads are found in different places. So one of the things you can look for is you're gonna need a place with water. Uh, typically, because they breed, the easiest way is to, is to hear them, but you're gonna look for a place that has water. So everything from any park that has a water source, you may find them, um, and that's a great place to look. I would definitely look um, any of our parks and places like that that have water. So one of the questions was, can toads fight back from predators? Um, that's a great question. The answer is they sure can. Um, one of the things they definitely can fight back with a lot of times, believe it or not, a snake may spit a toad out because they don't taste good. They also can puff up. And so inflating um, um, their bodies and making them look a lot larger, some snakes may back down because they, they actually look so large they can't swallow them. Some of them, when they're trying to eat them, when they puff up, they may get so large that the snake decides he can't swallow them and spit it back out. And, and they also have those toxins that don't taste very good. And so those are some of the ways that a toad can protect itself. 
Um, I'll go ahead and answer. This is a really good question. And then we'll wrap up here. Where do um, they go in the wintertime? Um, all of our frogs and toads typically hibernate. And so they bury themselves down either into the bottom of a pond, if they happen to be a bullfrog or something like that, um, or they go in the leaf litter. And so they bury themselves um, somewhere deep down below the frost line. Some of the tree frogs go down inside of trees and pipes and things like that. Um, they have to get to a place that's below freezing temperatures, typically for most of our frogs and toads. So those were a great question. And we'll, we'll, um, if you have any more, please leave them up there. Um, we have a poll at the end here. Um, we're going to put out there um, if you guys can let us know um, what you thought about the program. Um, thank you for uh, joining us today here. Um, and feel free to reach out and send us questions to the Zoom. We'll do our best to answer those questions. Hope you guys enjoyed the program. Um, thank you for participating. And at the end here, if you're still on there, you can also email our questions um, to the email address on the screen.